th first of all, thank you for uh, everyone who's attending HexCon 20. My name is Brian Seeley. I am a cybersecurity expert, hacker, uh, expert in uh, social engineering. And I'm going to be talking about social engineering and how you can kind of mitigate it, maybe some of the uh, things you didn't know, um, ways to prevent it, how it's kind of manifests. Um, just have a fun little conversation. And my gift to everyone is no PowerPoint. Uh, normally I use something, but uh, this time I think it'd be more fun to just have a conversation. Um, try and get too technical, people tend to fall asleep. So in order to keep your attention, I am kind of known for um, one of the first things that I did was a social engineering combo attack. Um, I wiretapped the Secret Service and the FBI uh, using Google Maps. And part of that process uh, was a social engineering vector. Um, now you're thinking that sounds dumb and you'd be right. That was not the smartest thing that I could have done at that point. So in 2014, I was going back and forth with Google and they said, I was telling them that there's people manipulating search results for Google Maps, uh, specifically related to businesses, uh, kind of like Yelp or Yellow Pages, any of these types of directories that can be manipulated so that the top results are controlled by, if you can control them at all, uh, controlled by a few people and in every city in almost every country. And there's a huge financial incentive for this. If you can get all the phone calls, you'll get all the business. Your competitors will go out of business. People will call you. Um, money is always uh, one of the primary motivators, almost always the primary motivators. So I found a way to manipulate the maps and say, okay, here's some funny listings. Um, I made a concentration camp in North Korea uh, about a South Park joke. I changed the Russian embassy in the United Kingdom to, I think it was a gay bar with Vladimir Putin's picture on it. Like, not the best, maybe not the best target for a joke. Uh, the Westboro Baptist Church, Scientology, Church of Scientology, a few other things. Just made practical jokes, changed stuff. And then I made... Um, Edward Snowden's secret hiding place on the White House lawn and changed the Library of Congress to the Zoolander kids of the school of kids who can't read good just to make the funniest things I could think of at the time. So it's going back and forth. Google says it's a spam issue. You're not eligible for any sort of bug bounty. And that's not what I was after, but they weren't really taking it that seriously. Nothing. There wasn't anything compromising about it to them. So I thought the next night, I had done a sh an episode of um, the news with Como here in Seattle and they filmed a majority of it and they even got on the phone with Google or recorded the call that I had with Google um, and they ended up hanging up on me because they said it was impossible. And then I did something live while they were on the phone and I made a daycare center in a popular city in Seattle and it ranked number three within a few minutes. So I could prove what I was saying. So they hang up and I'm getting frustrated and I'm saying, okay, this is a problem. This is a big company pushing back. This is Google, you know, F me, right? Idea being, um, what could I do that's dangerous or potentially compromise? If I'm not going for money, if I'm not trying to manipulate the mapping results to get more business, what could I do if I was after information? Could I pretend to be a congressperson or an attorney? Hmm, these are good. Uh, law enforcement. Uh, that's good. FBI. And I was watching The Rock with Nicolas Cage. And so then I picked the San Francisco office of the FBI. And then I picked the Secret Service in Washington, D.C. And I know this is stupid, but I'm still here. So obviously uh, it worked out. I changed or I added uh, new locations for the FBI and the Secret Service. So the original exists and I copied all the pictures and I had the font or all the formatting all correct and match everything. They looked exactly the same, except for the phone numbers were different. The phone numbers had a 425 area code and those 425 area codes 
were marketing phone numbers that pointed to the real switchboards of either one of them. So if you called my number, it would be a seamless call to them. And then I flagged all their locations as spam and they got deleted because I was like, hey, these are duplicates, get rid of them. And Google had a whole mechanism for uh, crowdsourcing edits called uh, via Google Map Maker, and then just through regular like report this listing. So use a VPN, change your IP, get a new account, report the listing, sign out, repeat the whole process. And you can look like seven or eight people are complaining and trying to be helpful and deleted the original listings. And then once that happened, my listings would come up when you'd search for Washington DC Secret Service or Secret Service Washington DC. Bam, my result, click the call button, marketing phone number records the call and passes it on seamlessly. So if you call the Secret Service through my listing, you get the Secret Service. No one is like, why would you think that anything is wrong when it, everything went according to plan? And that's uh, as soon as mine became the default, I got a lot of phone calls. I listened to a couple of them just to confirm that it worked and then panicked and didn't realize like, oh, this is not good. This didn't, this worked really way too well. And I called a few friends who were in law enforcement that I served with in the Marine Corps. Uh, one of whom was in the FBI. <laughs> he was not happy <laughs> with me. He's like, what are you, dude? What? Okay, so what did you do? And I told him the whole thing I just told you guys. And he, he's just like shaking his head. And you can hear him going, dude, what? Ugh, all right, okay, okay. Well, you need to go turn yourself in and tell them what you did. So I called the FBI and they hung up on me. Uh, the guy's like, yeah, we'll get back to you, buddy. Okay, okay, you go take your meds. You know, go take a nap somewhere, you know, that he thought that I had escaped from some place that I needed more meds or less meds, something. Then I called after I um, didn't get back here back from him. I got in my car and I drove to downtown Seattle and there's a secret service office down there. And I walked in and it's this um, 12 by 12 room, sort of a lobby. And there's one door. There's like three chairs, secret service sign on the wall, big bulletproof, um, like a prescription drug window, like where you'd go and um, pay for something. You slide stuff into the slot and there's nobody there. And there's a little phone on a desk and there's nothing on the walls inside you can see because they're defending against social engineers. Uh, it's really kind of clever. Uh, they're good at their job. So I knock, I get I, the guys come out. I end up talking to them. I explain the whole thing and they're like, okay, they're rolling their eyes. They're definitely not interested in what I have to say, but they took everything that I said. Uh, it was like three of them and they're in suits and they've all got little earpieces and a whole, the whole deal. So I said, okay, I can prove this. And this is the social engineer moment. This is what it's like to be a magician on the street. Everything that looks random and it, it looks like magic but it's not, it's very carefully calculated. Well, well, for the magicians, at least they've practiced hundreds of times. I had not practiced this. This was just dumb luck. So I said, call the DC office of the secret service and I can prove it. So he pulls his cell phone out. Da, 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 da. He taps on it a few times, puts it up to his ear. And he, when the guy picks up, all I could hear, I mean, all we could hear is him on the phone going, yep, hey, no, this is uh, agent so-and-so in Seattle. I'm researching something. But he knew the guy, like the agent who answered the phone and him had a relationship. You could tell that they have know each other by a name basis. And so he hangs up. So what happened and what I was hoping he would do is... Think about it. How many people think that he would have that number saved for the very specific office of the Secret Service in Washington, D.C., that field office? It wasn't the headquarters. It was a field office. He, There's no way he would. They could change numbers. There's no way you're keeping track of all of them in your phone. The easiest way to do it is to search for it and the trusted result. Now, if he's got an Android phone, he's going to use Google or Google Maps. Those are default searches. If he had Apple Maps, maybe he could have gotten a different result. Um, 
It could have been provided by Yelp or something else the way Apple was at the time, but he used Google maps and he pulled up secret service, Washington, DC, and he picked the first listing and he pushed call. And it doesn't show the phone number. When you do that, it shows just a call button because the space in the UI on a cell phone, they don't want to waste a whole bunch of it. So he pushes the call button, talks to the dude. And then my phone got a notification saying, you got an inbound marketing call to your campaign called secret service because I'm original and I'm an idiot. And so then I push play and I push speaker. And now all of us in the room heard the conversation and we could hear the other guy and they lost their sense of humor real quick, really, really quick, <laughs> immediately. And the, the guy who made the call said, oh, shh, and a word that I'm not gonna say right now. And then they uh, told me to put my stuff over here and that my hands need to go on the wall and they're going to search me. And they patted me down and they read me my rights, but they said, you're not being detained. You're not under arrest. We want to just ask you questions because this is now something we're very, very interested in. And so they took me to a room and questioned me for four hours. Rest is history. It led to a bunch of other different things. The moment of social engineering was like being a magician. I was explaining it to my daughter. So if you've got a deck of playing cards, we were watching uh, America's Got Talent and the guy's fanning out the cards and he says, pick, or, and he puts like 10 or 12. It's like some, actually some creepy chick. And she's like, you need to pick the killer out of this thing. And the woman picks this one photo or one name, and it happens to be the name in this story that's in this book and then revealed. And then all of these little things later on hinged upon her picking that one card with the name on it. And my daughter's like, how did she do that? And I'm like, well, it's psychological practice in forcing someone to take a card they didn't intend to. Chances are it was this type of thing. I don't know the magician's trick for sure, but psychologically they've practiced with a lot of people to figure out which card people are going to take based on subtle movements. You can psychological references. There's all sorts of things um, in your subconscious that are susceptible. So the guy, I knew he was probably going to do a search, not have the number that wouldn't have worked. It would have fallen flat. It had to be a search. It had to be on Google. And that's where it got lucky. But you don't have to get lucky every time to be a successful scammer. You only have to get lucky once. If you're on the enterprise side of it, you have to get be successful 100% of the time. So what happens? Let's, you got to assume failure. Let's assume failure for a second. You've clicked on the link. You did. I did. I've done it before. I haven't always known this stuff. I didn't come out of the womb knowing all this stuff about cybersecurity. It didn't exist until 1998, 97. HTTPS wasn't a thing, really. No one used it. That would be a, a hacker's dream to go back 30 years and just own everything. That being said, we learn and we adapt to new information. So now, you know, don't click on links people send you. People can, will try to impersonate someone, you know, so they'll break into Carl's email account and try to email from Carl's to John's and Doug's and Bill's and Bob's and say, Hey man, can you send me, can you, can you pay this invoice? Somebody, blah, blah, blah. And that, and that works too. And it happens all the time uh, because people will, well, I'm only not supposed to click on links from people I don't know, but it doesn't apply to people I do know. Yeah, but what if someone's pretending? Don't, and who would do that? Oh, they would do that. That They prep, they make these websites in advance. It's taking those preparations to figure out which card you're gonna pick likely. Uh, is it the first one? Is it the seventh one? Is it the 15th one? People practice, magicians practice, social engineers practice, scammers practice, and they get good at it. 
they get and you can get even better at it if you just keep practicing so you clicked on the link and if it sent you somewhere and you gave them your credentials that's a whole problem it's a different problem than you downloaded something someone sent you an email with a spreadsheet you're saying hey this is from accounting your expense report totally effed up you're not getting your bonus this year you're going to click it aren't you you want to click it i want to click it i don't want to lose money your account's been compromised and all the money in your checking account is gone click here to dispute mm. I want to click it or call this 1-800 number no one's going to call the 1-800 number they're going to click the link but even better would be go to your provider directly without clicking the link and find out what the deal is and then check the 1-800 number that they really have for customer service or look at the back of your card but because you've now been injected in your brain with a false sense of urgency <gasps> but you didn't know about it five minutes ago. So there's no major urgency. Is anything on fire right now near you? No, not urgent. Almost, almost certainly not urgent. Feels urgent, sure, but it is. And most of the time that's fake urgency and you just fell for it. So take a deep breath, gather information, figure out what the right move is. And you can usually wait a few minutes after learning bits of information to just verify. Um, the AP, Associated Press, Twitter account was hacked. Oh, let's see. It's in the last 10 years, let's just say. And someone tweeted out that a bomb killed President Obama and two other people or something like that. And the Dow dropped 150 points in 15 minutes before they could delete the tweet. That was worth $200 billion, maybe in market value, 150 billion. I don't know. I'm not really great at estimating how much the Dow was worth 10 years ago. But off the top of my head, it's hundreds of billions in market value lost because someone was able to, and it was like um, uh, the, the Syrian digital army or some Leban yeah, some uh, Syrian Liberation Army. I think that was it. Um, and they, they did think mission accomplished. They sent out a tweet and lost $200 billion for the West. That's a pretty successful tweet. Uh, I would have thought that would be one of the more damaging tweets of all time, um, but not this year. There's been plenty of other ones, plenty of dumb ones. So they lost, they were able to devalue something with just less than 144 characters. That's hilarious. It's devastating. Someone clicked the link and gave access. Someone didn't set up two-factor authentication and their account got hacked. And most people use the same password. So then all your accounts get hacked. And if someone gets your Gmail and if you use Chrome and you save your passwords, they break in. I had a client two days ago, the day before Thanksgiving, call me and was like, everything I own has been hacked. And that's how we figured it out was someone was trying to sabotage her business and broke into Gmail, got into Chrome, was able to get backup codes, turn off two-factor authentication, um, had stolen her SIM card to get the two-factor um, text prompt initially and then she was able to retrieve and get everything back but damage was super and it's so hard to change 80 passwords across a ton of accounts it took hours it's not fast don't use the same password over and over again especially if you haven't don't have 2fa and if if they have it and you're not using it you deserve it you're asking for it you're driving a car and not locking your doors you're not you have a a sign on your front door of your house that says the key is under the mat. It's just negligent because we know better. So she was able to get everything resolved, but he was able to get access to all these saved passwords that are stored in Google Chrome uh, for convenience sake. 
Um, I use a password manager. It's just not Google Chrome. And it, um, I've used Chrome in the past. I've used LastPass. And that's great because you've got an extension manager, which will, if someone gets access, you still have to sign in there too to get access to your passwords. And you can restrict everything to using like a USB YubiKey or some court, some sort of two-factor, um, like FIDO, whatever the the technology associated with those USB physical keys. And they're great. It makes for a much more secure experience. You have to have that key. So you have to have a physical control. You have to have the information that they know. You have to really, really do your homework. And it makes it significantly harder than just guessing a password based on a previous breach or like trying to sign into things that you've already created before. So she was able to retrieve everything, luckily. But they, yeah, oh, they did a lot of damage. If you download something because you got an email from somebody you didn't know, there could be an embedded zero day. And that's where endpoint security really helps. If if you're going on old heuristics-based endpoint security where it's just, I've seen this virus before, stop it. But if you've never seen it, that's a problem because they can use cryptors and binders, these different types of software programs that will take a, a, a payload and make the wrapper be look like different wrapping paper. And it has a different signature and it encrypts everything inside of it so that you can't scan and get a, and get a good idea of what's inside the package because it's never seen it. It's like, okay, this is a new box. We don't have any idea what's in it. X-ray technology doesn't work. So it's taking lead and putting lead on the inside of the box on the wrap. You have no idea. So you have to open it. Now, every single time it'll defeat one of those scanners, but it, what it won't defeat is whitelisting for like application security, which is primarily bundled with um, antivirus software. Uh, you can actually have it already deployed with Windows in an Active Directory environment. And that's what I'm most familiar with is, um, or programs like Sentinel-1, uh, there's a ton of different, CrowdStrike, there's tons of different good endpoint security platforms out there that incorporate all this stuff. So you, for the application whitelisting to be essential, it has to be turned on, number one. And you can say, okay, all programs that do not appear on the approved list don't get to run. I don't care what it is. Portable, um, malicious, and I think some of them can be st uh, can stop process injection and different types of new hacking techniques. The idea is it has to match a very specific signature, and if it doesn't, it doesn't work. And you can come up with the list. You just go through and say, okay, these are if you're managing your endpoints properly, and everything's got imaged, and you've got like mobile device management, and you've got um, Intune and these types of things, and so all your laptops follow a certain image. Chances are using like a STIG or some sort of um, security um, model that you're following and some framework. You then say, okay, these are the programs that everyone needs. And if someone needs to add one, they just send you, okay, I want to install this program. You get the MD5 hash. You say, this is the signature. This is what this program looks like. If it's this, you can run it and you whitelist it. And it doesn't, a lot of users complain that it's a slow process and it takes a while to get approval and pushback against that convenience factor. But would you rather have a job or not have a job? That's the question. And when they when it gets explained to them, it's like, okay, this is a this is to keep us safe from you and all of us, because chances are with a thousand people in our company, one of us is going to click on something we shouldn't have. Do you really want that to just destroy the whole company or would you rather have a couple minutes of in inconvenience? And that's what it really comes down to. Nobody wants to go to the front desk and walk into the building because there's only one entrance because of security purposes. Everyone would rather have a, an entryway that's closer to their car or whatever, but that's not the way the world works. We have to secure things physically sometimes. So 
you then have a front desk and you have cameras and you have locked doors and there's a process, but we all, we're all okay with that because we're used to it. So get used to new IT security controls because they're there to keep you having a job. I mean, security guys don't think of things just to mess with you. I promise. We have way bigger things to do. Um, I'd rather be doing a million things than having to sit and explain to users why something's beneficial to them. Another story about social engineering. Um, there's some really famous social engineers. Uh, Frank Abagnale from Catch Me If You Can. His story is fascinating. This guy was doing check fraud. He pretended to be a pilot. I'm pretty sure he didn't actually fly a plane. I think he also be, pr pretended to be a lawyer and then actually passed the bar exam later. He pretended to be a doctor. He did a bunch of stuff. And the movie didn't even touch on all the stuff that the guy did that was crazy. Like he did some really, really ballsy and crazy stuff. Uh, Kevin Mitnick, um, friend of mine now in the industry, he's... Uh, was a brilliant engineer and hacker and also spent five years in solitary confinement. He was the, the good guy he is now who spends his time educating and uh, prevent, helping people prevent these types of things. His company uh, that he works for is no before and they do social engineering training and a lot of different things. As a, as a rule, I normally don't pitch products. I'm product or vendor kind of agnostic for the most part, but I don't get a referral from sending people to friends of mine like that. And he is, uh, they have a, amazing products, amazing services, and I recommend them. If you're looking for a place to start for social engineering or phishing training or those types of things, especially from a compliance perspective, yes, go um, hit up no before and say, you were, you were introduced by another person, whatever. Um, they're really great guys. So in my personal life, um, social engineering over the phone came in very handy. I, if, let's see, 2014 is when I gave my TED talk called Wiretapping the Secret Service it can be easy and fun. And right around that time, my, my son was born in December, 2014. And uh, I already had a daughter. I got full custody of both of them when he was just under a year. And my stepdaughter from the marriage before uh, her mom and I were divorced was taken um, for my ex-wife for negligence and my ex and I weren't getting along great at that point, but I ended up with full custody of my two kids. And then I became a foster parent to my stepdaughter because she didn't want to be in group homes. She had been battling drug problems and I'm a recovering, um, alcoholic and drug addict. Um, it's been a number of years, but at that point it wasn't. And uh, the last illegal substance for me was 2013, March 13th, 2013. Uh, I don't drink. Um, I've never been happier in my life. Uh, life is rewarding and amazing. Getting to educate and meet amazing people. But part of the reason I share this story is because uh, it's all about negatives turning into positives. Finding a way to take something that was a negative experience for myself and finding a way to educate and use it for good. Um, so the rest of the story. So I became a foster parent to my 16 year old, um, stepkid, former stepkid. Uh, let's call her Amber, like Amber alert. Uh, so she had drug problems. She's 16. My mom was diagnosed with cancer four years ago on Thanksgiving day. And yesterday was Thanksgiving here. And a month later, she, my daughter went missing. A uh, boyfriend and her were doing, uh, she had relapsed. Christmas is difficult for everybody, I think. Um, it's not always a perfect holiday. 
and she was sold into prostitution here in Seattle uh, and went missing for about a month. I looked for her every single day and ended up finding her. How that happened was I stum I was able to track uh, photos that were posted online of her uh, by someone using photo metadata, image reverse searches, searching for specific phrases from advertisements that were advertising her and saying, okay, take this keyword set, this sentence, search for it exactly, putting it in quotations, looking around, finding different ways to correlate, narrowing down the area where she was found and then talking to people in the area and saying, oh yeah, no, I saw her an hour ago. I saw her two, yes, yeah, sorry, yesterday. Ends up, I end up getting a phone number uh, that someone said, oh yeah, I think this is the number that she's at. She had called a friend of hers asking her for money so she could, I don't know, whatever. Not sure if she's in trouble, not sure what, what's going on. And I, I reversed the phone number, found an address to a business, found the per the business license, found the guy who owned the business at that time, did a phone number search for him, found his home address was able to track the phone number to and match that all up and figure out, okay, this is the landline. Now, if I call, no one's going to give me any information. So I have a friend who's also my kid's nanny at the time at home watching the kids so I can be out in the middle of the night. And this is like one in the morning on a Sunday morning, Saturday night. And so I'm standing in front of this house and it's like end of January, four years ago freezing cold, tired as hell. I text the girl, Hey, call this number, say you're a friend of Amber's and that you, she asked you to bring her cigarettes or something. She calls the number. Some guy answered. She asked for Amber. The guy says, okay, hold on one minute and puts her on the phone. And she's like, hello, something, something. And she, then she hung up texted me, said, okay, she's, she's in the house. That's social engineering. That's making up something on the fly. It's like comedy or like improv. I mean, that situation is not comedy, <laughs> but improv is the key. It's being able to roll with anything that comes up and not saying no. The, the secret to improv is always going, yes, I'll, Yes, yes, my harmonica is made out of a dog. And like, whatever the thing is, you just keep going with whatever insane thing that's happening instead of putting the bricks or putting the brakes on and uh, revealing what's going on. So you're cool with whatever. So she messaged me. I called the police and the FBI who was looking for her. And two hours later, they did a health and welfare inspection. Uh, they Well, they showed up, they took information, they didn't believe me, they thought I was just insane, and she was there. And they took her to the ER, she got into rehab, she is, I saw her a couple weeks ago, she's doing great. So, social engineering um, can be used for good. Uh, people get trained in it so that they can actually pretend to be social engineers and try to trick executives into clicking email links. Um, a really popular one that works is... Glassdoor.com, a uh, new sexual harassment lawsuit filed against C-level executive at XYZcompany.com. Click here to read more. Who's going to click? Somebody's going to do it. Somebody does almost every single time. And we just gave them the training and said, don't do this. We're going to send out an email today. And the executives, for some reason, more often than the younger crowd, especially in the fishing um uh, training things from a percentage standpoint, but oftentimes the first people that are attacked or emailed uh, in a bulk campaign are the lower level employees because they're more susceptible. They're, they're not going to uh, be susceptible. Like why, why would I be targeted? I'm nobody, but a C level knows that they could be spearfished. And that's, uh, that's what happened with like the DNC when they, all their emails got breached and Amy Wasserman Schultz got fired. It was all from a campaign manager, I think, who had clicked on something that was Gmail and they stole his credentials and then that was it. Bam, everything was lost. If you click on something and it asks for creds, I, I, I warned you, don't do it. I'm, I'm telling you uh, from the guy who knows this stuff, 
don't do it. But I'll help you fix it for a retainer. Um, that being said, endpoint security will mit it's not going to mitigate all stupidity, but it will stop ransomware from spreading. The number one thing that they're trying to do, uh, this doesn't really protect with spear phishing and like bank routing problems and you going and uh, going to the bank and pulling money out to go send via Western Union. You didn't touch a computer since any of that happened. Someone calls you and tricks you over the phone. There's nothing we can do. But if you want to mitigate viruses and malware, and especially the spread of ransomware, segment your networks, limit permissions, have a good endpoint security solution that you can manage from a central place. So it's not just a thousand endpoints you have to manage. It's one console that manages regardless of how many devices it is. Everybody gets the same sort of treatment and they're isolated from each other. Ransomware won't spread much. And if you have a, a decent enough security team, you can go and reprogram ransomware to be non-malicious. Or you could go and program something that says, okay, this is going to act like ransomware, but all it's going to do is create one encrypted text file in the temp directory. Let's see how bad it gets. And go. You want to be practicing and testing this stuff. Can, would you bet your job that it's going to work if you haven't tested it? Stay tuned. That being said, I, um, again, very, very, very grateful that I got to be a part of this. I'm going to be watching some of the other speakers. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn uh, or Twitter. Uh, go ahead and send me anything you want with links. I'm not going to click them. Um, yeah, be safe.